in PropTech ecosystem, we are noticing VCs are doing safe bet on B2B market. Uh, the democratization of real estate will happen to a large extent. To be honest, sustainability in India is going to take a very different shape and form than the Western world. So tell me in early stage when founder, as Jitendra also said, that you don't have many options, right? Choose the ones you are getting. But in that way, doesn't it impact a founder business? How does a founder even in the starting stage where you're saying you don't have much options, select whoever you feel is going to invest? But that can also impact a person business in long run, right? It's, it's a question, right? Again, starts off, what are the options you have and what do you balance, right? I mean, if some no-name fund came to Sanjay and said, okay, take my money and you run the business the, the way I want to, he's, he's going to say, go take a hike. But maybe someone who's really struggling, right, has like two months of salaries unpaid, really wants to make this business. And maybe she or him might decide to dance with the devil and swallow the bitter pill, right? It's It's very, very, I would say, you know, situational, right? And uh, there is no straightforward answer that one can give you saying, hey, you should do this or you should not do this. Like going back to what Sanjay said, you're not walking in my shoes, right? I mean, how can you decide that like, it's very easy? Like we'd all love to have, okay, X, Y, Z, uh, angels on my on their cap table, right? Today, as my cohort is graduating, right? We are trying our very best, right? To make sure that we craft the cap table, right? But I think what's interesting is, you can sort of choose, right? You want some cheerleaders on the cap table. You want some strategics on the cap table. You want some only money guys on the cap table. You want some solid partner. Like, and there's a saying in venture, you don't choose the fund, you choose the partner you work with, right? Now, again, this comes as a luxury. Going back to what Jitendra said, if you can create that FOMO, right, where people are dying to get into your round. I mean, YC demo days used to be like that, right? I mean, you didn't have to probably make a deck and there'll be like checks being thrown under your uh, door, right? So... Uh, it's like, not, like exactly. not exactly, but you get my point, right? So, you know, it, it, it completely depends on the dynamics, right? You no, know, it's very situational. Uh, you know, take example of PTM itself, Vijay Shekhar Sharma's journey, right? I mean, eventually, he there was a situation where he had to do a round with Q Angels. He had to sell, you know, a major portion of his yeah. company. So, it's it's not like a perfect picture that we draw that, you know, I have X thing in mind and, you know, when I all check boxes would be ticked mm. is when, you know, I'm going to accept money. Mm. It's the, you know, optimization that you do at that point of time because you have to pay bills. You, you know, mm. there is a team that you are answerable to. You have brought a company to a certain stage. You don't want it to go down downhill from here, right? So that's one piece. The second piece, I think, where most of the problem comes in. And to be honest, I think I see the meeting of minds from investor perspective is also, you know, he said like both of them as a founder touched upon an important point. I'm building this for long run. I'm not building this for 10 years. And there is a, you know, what Keshav said, the product being sold in the VC world to LPs, we sell 10 year window. Unfortunately, SEBI doesn't allow us to make a fund which is evergreen, uh, right? right? There are problems there on the regulatory mm -hmm. side. Mm -hmm. But see, if you have that view and if you believe that, you know, I'm not, and not somebody who's gonna who will be able to build this for 10 years you will have to accordingly choose those kind of partners maybe you will be better off going to you know folks uh, which are sovereigns mm. uh, for that matter who doesn't have this fixed fund life you are better off going to uh, you know family offices we do not have this problem of uh, you know uh, that uh, finding an exit in 6 years or 8 years mm. I think that's choices you can make uh, and again, I mean, that would all depend on how, what convincing power you have to get people excited and come and join you in that year. So, right, I think there those choices, of course, are available to you. Actually, uh, one of the easy thumb rule that uh, we practice is like uh, talking to the portfolio companies, which are already, so between VC1 versus VC2, uh, if you get like, you talk to the portfolio company founders, you get fa very fairly idea, like typically talk to the ones who have actually failed. You'll get a good idea from them and you will get also a good idea from the successful ones. Like uh, if you look at the history, like uh, there are a lot of in India, there are a lot of very, very successful companies actually had problems with the initial set of investors because of rights, liquidation rights and all that. And we have seen them uh, not doing that well. So now if you talk to the founder of that company, portfolio company, you will get a very good feedback and you can decide between VC1 and VC2. So that is a good practice that we will do. So tell me, coming to that point, um, in PropTech ecosystem, we are noticing 
VCs are doing safe bet on B2B market. They are doing safe bet when it comes to uh, companies like No Broker and all because the model is understandable plus is B2C. So you know the returns how it would be. But when it comes to companies which are like channel partners, B Square Yards or B, for example, the recent one, Property Pistol, we are seeing they are able to raise funds only from banks, but not from VCs. So, for example, Ashish, the founder of Property Pistol, said clearly that when they went to VCs to make them understand about their model, which is a channel partner model of theirs, they were not ready to bet in money because they are very skeptical when it comes to real estate market. But when they go to a bank, they are ready because they can vision the complete how the bigger picture will be when it comes to channel bro brokers and how the real estate market is evolving. So do you feel when it comes to Indian VCs, they are still doing safe bets when it comes to Indian prop tech ecosystem? I'll start with Jitendra. See, uh, see, it is not about uh, safe betting. It is much more about uh, how VC works and how banks work. Yeah. Right? Mm. So VCs will really work on a multi-ex exit. Right. Okay, so they look for a story which has a huge market. And typically, if you're talking about the B2B channels market for uh, market, like for selling primary sales, majorly are in the primary sales. Yeah. It's uh, fairly restricted to like uh, in a year, we sell around 300,000 houses in India. So 300,000 houses and typically the average sale price is 60 lakhs. Okay. Out of that, every of all this B2B guys will maximum have a capacity of 2% two, of it. So that's like is a market potential, which is 4,000 crores. Right, so four thousand crores is not exciting for most of the VCs, big VCs, mm. right? But uh, if you look at a the bank, they're looking at the cash flows. Yeah. So all of these guys are having good cash flows, right? Which is commendable, and this business has potential to, uh, you know, build uh, to a fairly large four thousand, three thousand crores company in the long run and uh, in terms of revenue. So that way, for a bank to invest, it is easier because they see the cash flow, they see that I'm investing and getting a return. Yeah. Whereas uh, for a, any particular VC, that multi X exit. Uh, they don't foresee that. So that's the reason like much much of the VCs have not touched that part. That's a good problem to have in mm -hmm. my view because you don't have to value if bank is willing to put in the money. Right? Yeah. And uh, to be honest, uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, a, any founder I'm sure would agree with me here that uh, they would want to accept money from bank than VCs because it helps them, you know, save dilution in the company and build larger value in the business. So from that perspective, honestly, I feel it's a good problem to help. Uh, I would love the banks to write checks, uh, you know, fund the founders. I think the VC comes into play because banks are not willing to take that risk, right? Yeah. And they are basically balance sheet based investors. They look at cash flow and then eventually if they get comfort, they will, you know, sort of uh, come in. VCs exist because they have to take that risk. I mean, that banks are not willing to take in early stage. And, and I think, that's a good problem to have in my view. Regarding, see, r whether VCs are taking risk or not, I think, see, honestly, uh, while I think uh, this asset class does exist to take risk, uh, the biggest challenge for this, uh, you know, ecosystem had been finding quality exits in a mm. market like India. And I do agree, unlike maybe a lot of time we end up comparing, hey, in US, X happened, Y happened, people, yeah. you know, early stage bets. Uh, where I think the challenges are, I think that the depth of market is very different in terms of the market size and, you know, uh, in terms of the availability of capital and everything. And that's where I, I would agree that we are not as sort of, you know, risk taking uh, society. I mean, that that's true with everything that we do, right? I mean, mm. our risk appetite is much different from, let's say, a developed market uh, because the way they are brought, brought up, that has been different. The the depth of the market is different. The capital which is available, you know, in terms of risk-taking ability is different. So that's the fundamental difference. Hopefully, I mean, we have, you know, quality founders like Jithin and Sanjay. Mm. Uh, you know, they will grow these big companies. A lot of, you know, the folks who are eventually getting exit, they are coming mm. back into the VC business, you know, setting up their own shop. Mm. And I think that is going to change the risk profile, uh, right? In terms of what kind of startups you back and... Mm their risk appetite would be very different from, let's say, traditional LP. True, true. So, Keshav, you must have seen all the escalator programs under Brigade Tree. Recent uh, bet is on clean tech, smart tech. It's, it's, it's giving you that kind of returns, that kind of, you know, uh, I would say the trend is happening, sustainability, and everyone is talking about it, and even investing. Of course, it's important, and 
it's a way to go ahead but you would be also seeing few startups in your accelerator program which are not maybe replica of global uh, players but are also facing challenge to uh, raise money because there is for example more on the front of a channel broker or even in the uh, work towards the developer front to create that kind of tech not for the customer so how you go about it like how do you make show sure that founders understand that there are still a risk uh, taken by a few uh, vcs they have that appetite and how do you make sure their motivation is there so i think it sort of ties in to the earlier question and i'll sort of explain that why right the kind of capital that is available determines a lot of sector when it starts getting hot or not hot right we see as first check becomes a shorthand right for anyone who's trying to raise funds i have to understand i think going back to what jitin said right the risk profile for a vc the kind of you know if to understand the product right i mean if you understand the product it's very easy to understand when i go to a bank why a bank gives me a 9% loan against a home loan i i simply think of it like this right why is a home loan running at 8.4% versus a personal loan at 12% or if you go i will not name another fintech right will give you 24% personal loans instant because the risk profile the appetite where you get clubbed in is very different same way when you come to venture right there are a lot of founders who walk in and say listen i've got a sustainable business i've got 2 crores uh, of uh, you know revenue and you're willing to or, you know all the vc say this is not good enough right because maybe for some people like said 4000 crore itself is not exciting market so they then say but you'll go and fund like a person who's you know uh, the repeat founder and he's going to burn them uh, business down because ultimately right i mean there's a certain outcome that a venture capital desires so it's very important to understand what kind of output is required and do you fit that profile right the extra 100x return especially at the early stage because if 80% of the companies are going to die 20% have to be extreme outliers and that's a far number and not even getting into the fact of will they actually get an exit with the depth of the market right now coming to the second part in terms of uh, you know availability of capital for uh, alternate companies right or esg companies right i look at we all discussed that the uh, the ecosystem is young right we've had a few ipos so i look at uh, the venture journey in india in three parts right what happens on the screen which is a lot of consumer like you know uh, skew morphic era right you know things going from offline to online then what happened behind the screen this is the api and infra layer that really came out with the saas businesses and you know so that was the second part now the third layer which we are finally in is what's happening outside the screen and now these are difficult businesses let's not kid ourselves right when you're working for with the built environment these are not easy businesses to build so finally when we have founders who are more confident right who've been through a journey once twice right and are ready to dedicate that time and energy that is when the ecosystem moves forward now secondly it comes to the color of capital because a lot of funds have been raised from with a very esg focused mandate to their lps right so when the capital goes now what you have the balances is the capital and the talent and the number of companies that are being formed is an equilibrium otherwise again there will be a bubble and then the ecosystem goes back by a few years right having said that we are at least at reap right i mean in this cohort itself i think we have two companies that are working right team of great scientists do not come from bangalore come from the east of india right trying advanced nano materials to reduce clinker we have a company you know the founders are here who are actually using up to 80% of plastic in building uh, paper blocks right which is not very typical that you hear coming out of uh, you know our ecosystem and these are difficult bets and they've been at it for years and now we are finally seeing an appetite when we are taking them out and meeting investors right but they're willing to bet small but they're finally betting right earlier even if you go to a developer or any uh, consumer right of uh, real businesses you know our metric was very simple we used to say show them either how can you help them to reduce cost or make more money now finally the third element is coming into picture which is the sustainability and why right a lot of it you'll see is in the commercial space because now you have amazons and you know the walmarts of the world the global players are coming to india they made net zero uh, targets right that they've taken certain targets now you can't take it in isolation right you can't say okay i'm going to do only net zero in uh, us and europe and all my other presence can be like i'll just buy carbon credits right i think companies are uh, going to see a downstream effect so if you have a large occupier global occupier who has net zero targets automatically there's a huge change in terms of you know what the builders are building for right and ultimately those builders have to be supplied by new age companies so it's a trickle down effect 
But finally, we are very happy to see that the third consideration for startups, apart from cost, reduce cost or make more money, the third part, help me become more green. Like literally, we have developers coming and, you know, speaking, what are the part, portfolio companies can help us become more green? And now then we sort of work with them to say, hey, just becoming green is a very big uh, you know, uh, problem statement. Can we break it down? But yeah, that's what I'd leave it at. Sanjay, you want to add to this risk appetite of investors in the Indian market? Um, I think safe and VC don't go in the same sentence together. I think it's paradoxical in nature, so it doesn't make sense. Um, in terms of why banks invested in certain companies, if you look at the type of companies that they've invested in, I don't think uh, fast-growing founders have the time for a bank in India to make a decision. True. Right? Uh, the people with options, uh, the best investors, they don't have time for any of the ICICI, SBIs to wait three, four months. I got to run a goddamn business. Right? I can't wait for a decision. And so if YC, who is probably one of the best early stage investors, we went through YC, if they can make a decision fairly quickly, then you know you probably have something to learn. And they've done pretty well. Their return on investment is far greater than any bank in India. And so, and if you look at the type of founders they're invested in, they're investing in a lot of, I would say, seasoned, um, more executive uh, style founders, which probably fits with the management of the mm -hmm. bank itself. The man, the bank management probably is a reflection of the founders they're selecting. So. Uh, the way banks work uh, is probably risk-weighted returns. The way founders go for is growth orientation, yeah. growth optimization. These are very two different ways of looking at things. And so banks can possibly invest in these startups that say, look, they could be part of my workflows. Whereas, and if you also look at the valuations that these banks are investing in some of these companies, they're not great valuations, right? Because, and... Even if you look at the banks um, in India, and they are very different than how Western banks are run. Broadly, you can break down business in, in, in India into who you know type of business or what you know business. Founders tend to operate in what you know business. Banks and bank executives tend to operate in more uh, style of who you know business. If you look at loan portfolio concentrations, they'll go to certain corporates. Um, it's a very relationship-based business uh, with banks. Uh, so. You probably need to build that relationship. You probably need to go through those uh, timelines. But I can guarantee you, Swiggy or Zomato or uh, none of the good founders are waiting around for banks to make decisions. Um, and they have to deal with regulators. They have to deal with these boards. And the speed of decision making is just abysmal. Um, and if the, it must be nice to run one of these public sector banks um, knowing that you can wake up in the morning and be protected by the government on the downside and uh, the upside gets you know attributed to you and you can always exit and become an advisor at other companies and uh, corporates, right? I would love to be the chairman of SBI. I don't know what risks I would have in running my business, what threats I have, because the government ultimately gives out a license and the government is also my shareholder in my business. I mean, what a fantastic boat. Startup founders would die for that. But for people in that position, I would not say that skin in the game, again, is truly reflective in the character of that organization, or they would know how to see it in others. Rarely do you see young founders getting funded by banks in India. Why is that? And I'm talking about like, you know, lower than 50s or 40s. So I'm not saying all the founders they invested in are old. That's not, that's not the point. I think I'm in my early 30s and I think I'm old by startup standards, but uh, banks operate in who you know business, not what you know business. And uh, it must be nice to be the chairman of SBI. That's all I can say. Great. So on that note, lastly, I want to ask from each one of you, the upcoming emerging trends, one or two, which you think is currently small, but will have a substantial growth in the future. Starting with you, Saras. See, to be honest, I would want the founders to tell me uh, you know, what they're thinking about and what they believe is going to be the next thing. Oh. Um, but uh, but see, broadly, I think Jitin and I were having this conversation, um, you know, and some of the ideas we were discussing about, uh, you know, this fractional ownership is still very small. We would see a lot many changes, uh, yeah. you know, around fractional ownership. It would be culmination of different things uh, right from blockchain uh, in terms of providing that safety net, you know, around, uh, you know, the safety, uh, the 
safety of those investments and your ability to sort of prove that these are essentially the transactions that you own. Uh, your ability to leverage that in terms of maybe making small check investments, maybe a lakh or so. Um, you know, we were just discussing about, let's say this bar, you want to own, you know, few percentage of that. Yeah. A uh, lot of AIFs could get created. Yeah. So, of course, that's one piece uh, definitely we feel is going to be, uh, it will come. The second piece, of course, that we are seeing still very early days, I think there are going to be a lot of plays around sustainability. But to be honest, sustainability in India is going to take a very different shape and form than the Western world. I don't think, you know, we will pay for sustainability because, you know, honestly, uh, people I have suddenly woken up and said, hey, I'm caring for environment and therefore I'll make sustainable choices. I think a lot of that would also be driven by cost consideration. So around energy, around water uh, conservation, I think those are the spaces where we would see a lot more actions uh, in the coming days, you know, if I see the broader prop tech space uh, in general. So I think it's always, always about the founder, right? Unless you're talking about a generational shift in the platform on what things are being built, right? So emerging trend in prop tech so ecosystem, right? Now. I think more and more, I think, fo focus on, you know, those who are focusing on distribution. And I'm not talking about distribution of uh, products, right? I think uh, I'm distribution to the customer, right? Uh, be it a SaaS founder, right? How are you increasing adoption, right? Those who are, like I said, we are so early stage in our journey in prop tech and not India. There's a dated McKinsey study that says we are the second lowest in terms of adoption, right? Only after agriculture and hunting. And that's a fairly low bar to beat, but so I'm happy that we beat that, right? But less than 1%, right? And a simple number. And that's why I don't want to, uh, not that any founder is going to start building in a section and you should not just because some investors are saying it's a hot sec area. But he mentioned, right, we sell about 300,000 uh, homes a year, right? We are the same population as uh, uh, China. 2022, China made 6.2 million homes. We made 0 0.3 million homes, right? So that is the gap that we have to catch up, right? So I think I'm extremely excited about affordability, right? If you can do it sustainability, more power to you. Like we are there with like, you know, checkbook. I think anything that becomes affordable, Right, that that to us is extremely exciting. Right, we are seeing dedicated effort, and we have some uh, folks in the crowd. Right, because now there's a lot of capital. There's a little bit more room for the founders to play in the ESG space. So I think sustainability, but don't just look at the green line, but also look at the black line, because that sort of sells the combination of having a dual impact, if you will. I think those are the two sectors on a very broad level. I'll leave it at that. Right. I mean, we could always talk about impact of Genia uh, and blockchain, so you know all that stuff. But you know, for us, it's about the founders, right? I think what founders are excited about building, and if we can find some merit in backing that. Mm. True, Sanjay. According to you, where do you think <clears throat> what is currently the small, uh, still emerging, but has a great uh, substantial growth in future? Yeah, I think like you were saying, so sustainability is uh, for India only mm -hmm. rated. Um, and it's not appropriate uh, for us at this point, point of deal in development. I understand it's important for Brigade, I uh, Sattva, because I'm sure majority of your best paying customers are Western corporations setting up ops in India, right? Uh, but if you actually kind of look, uh, we have a much larger fish to pride. Um, and that comes from both civic innovation, meaning the states need to decentralize and give cities power and municipalities much more power to make decisions instead of using the large cities in the state to subsidize the rest of the state. Um, every election, I'm talking about Bangalore, I'm talking about Mumbai, I'm talking about a lot of these, um, these cities, right? These municipalities have budgets greater than some of the major states in India. Yet, they don't have a street dedicated person uh, doing that. And an offshoot of that is cities need much better urban planning. I think that's the biggest problem that India has right now. The zoning, the infrastructure lines that need to be laid, the public utilities, all of these things essentially um, are gainful investments for a country. So whenever you invest in infrastructure, you want the rate of return for that infra to be greater than the cost of capital over the long run. And uh, you don't really do that with ESG in India. And also there's a huge differential in terms of uh, rental crisis, right? <coughs> you didn't mention, for instance, Amazon cannot have buildings um, in Seattle that are ESG and then have in India that are not. Well, they're certainly paying those employees much more differently in Seattle than they are in India, right? However, they care about that because that's what their home market dictates. 
That's what their short shareholders are dictated. But in India, I'm not sure sustainability is a thing. I think government innovation um, in terms of municipalities, uh, zoning needs to be improved. One of those things, um, I can tell you, for instance, we did demonetization. Uh, now, the idea was to cut down on, let's say, black money. If you really want to cut down on black money, all you have to do is close the gap between guideline values and true market values. Majority of the black money in India gets circulated because of the differential between market value and circle rates or guideline value. So you have to go down to the actual cause. I mean, there's political um, reasons for it, but that doesn't mean we should deny it that it doesn't exist. I understand. I operate in this environment. It's okay. We're a growing country. We'll get there when we get there. But I think um, public utilities, zoning, infrastructure, uh, these need to be changed first before we even consider talking about ESG as the catalyst for growth in Indian cities. True. I think um, as India is growing well, uh, like a 5 trillion economy by 2030, uh, typically many of the reports uh, typically suggest that uh, real estate will be like 1 trillion. Okay, so 1 trillion in terms of size. size. So it's obviously we can't beat China, but we'll be like almost uh, instead of like 5% of China, we'll be like 25-30% of China in size. So what will happen is typically one interesting figure is like how much is prop tech part portion of the real estate, right? Suppose the real estate becomes 1 trillion, how much will be the prop tech size? Okay, so there are a lot of uh, reports like I have also spent a lot of time to understand, but the rough estimates is 100 billion. Okay, so 100, like almost 100 billion is what we can actually see in prop tech. So today it is less than a billion, right? So it has to grow 100 times, right? So 100 times it has both like the channels that are available today to grow are like not working. So what we have seen like, uh, early stage startups, late stage startups are all struggling with ideas which are not scaling. Why it is not scaling? Perhaps what we have anticipated the rate of growth of the middle class families will happen to India to the upper class, it's not happening. Okay. So, uh, what will happen is what is and what is happening in India, if you see, I'm by from Proptic, is uh, retail investors are increasing. Yeah. Right? So, like if you look at uh, the normal uh, retail investors for uh, uh, all our region for its uh, normal share market, it has almost become four times. The thing that it is. So that number is increased. So what is as a trade? What is in series? If people who want to invest in the alternatives, that is increasing trust rate. Well, so what it means is people don't want to invest set at seven percent fixed deposit. Yeah, I mean, people are not buying homes that often because they're telling that I want to keep my, I don't have enough money to buy home. Down payment is be like. I have to take a personal loan to pay the down payment. So that is happening. So what will happen, what I think is, uh, the democratization of real estate will happen to a large extent. So typically, uh, huge tech parks will not be only owned by a few developers and few family offices. right? So people would love to invest there. And that as an option will start happening much more frequently. So you have AIFs which will happen. You have action ownership that will happen. And uh, people will be like, I can, can I invest like 10,000 rupees in a tech park here and be a shareholder there. So REITs will happen much more, right? So, and these are the plays which can happen at a very high level. And it will be largely, again, few uh, business families, few tech park owners will start this and eventually a uh, lot of uh, alternate funds will get created. Now, like, well, there are, and the limit of uh, entries are very high. Like AIF, we are talking about like one crore is minimum, right? So now, how will the normal investors will come? How will retail investors? That is where a lot of startups will come now, which will create platforms where retail investors can come in at as low as 5,000 rupees, right? So, so that is something and where like blockchain technology will be fairly used to create these avenues. There also I see a lot of prop tech investment will happen uh, to create these avenues where retail investors can participate in the larger picture. So that is going to uh, mostly be the future for prop tech in India. 